these things are putting out between 8 and 900 volts, just enough to shock these fish for a few seconds, give them enough time to net them, but they recover pretty much right away. That's got to be a snake. Yeah, way back up in there. Oh, nice. That's a big, ugly man. Big one. Oh, dude. They get a big hand. Not long ago, I decided to ditch the corporate grind to pursue my passions for traveling and the great outdoors. So I sold everything, moved into a trailer full time, and now I'm fishing my way across the entire country. There you go. Fish out. Look at that. You're watching Field Trips with Robert Field. That was insane. Morning. How are you? How are you doing? Morning, y'all, John. No, no. I'm not here yet. I'm Mike. Cool. Another biologist working. Mike? Yeah, Mike. Good to meet you. Nice Robbie. to meet you. Robbie? I'm Rob. Still hammering him? Yeah, we went out yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, John, John, meet you, man. Rob. John, Rob. Yeah. yeah. Great yeah. to meet you. Thanks for, thanks for having us. Hey, guys. Welcome to another episode of Field Trips. This is the second installment of my Northern Snakehead mini series. So today we got something pretty cool. We're heading out with John Odenkirk. He's a biologist and a couple of guys from his team. Uh, Jonathan Levitt met him a couple of years ago, did a really cool video. Uh, John has been tasked with researching these northern snakehead, figuring out what their impact is on the local fishery, the local waterways. So today should be pretty enlightening as we kind of try to get to the bottom of whether or not this invasive species is really as detrimental as people make them out to be. About to hop on the boat, we're gonna be shocking up some snakehead today, something I've never experienced. Should be a good time. Let's go see how they do this. Good. I'd say if right now I'd go ahead and work the outside edge of that aisle. Take the islands around. And then, it, and then that right edge, that little and then because, yeah, because, creek, because once that, we're and losing it. water, that gets harder to work. We could get in the basin regardless. second runs, okay. uh, which is a third of an hour. Yeah. So these things are putting out between eight and 900 volts, just enough to shock these fish for a few seconds, give them enough time to net them, but they recover pretty much right away. So, so, so conductivity is based on dissolved salts. Yeah. So when you get to salinity, that's like the ultimate, right? Because you're, you're, going, you're going parts per thousand of salinity. That, and then your connectivity goes off the root, and then we can't, we get to a certain point we can't shock. Right. Because, because the current goes around the fish instead of through the fish. And so like resistance, you know, electrical resistance. Huh. Oh, okay. I wouldn't even thought about that. Sometimes you'll find them like little tiny pockets way right in there. Like, this little corner here, whatever it is about, I don't know if it's the pier in combination with the spatter dock or the way this channel turns, and almost always two or three right in this tiny little stretch yeah, here. Like loaded driftwood and trash. They love these corners too. That's mostly in like April and earlier in the season. Before they um, they still had one here on natural wood. You know? Yep. It's like another male kind of losing his pattern already. Yeah. That's really tasty looking spot. Now a lot of times you get in a habitat like this, we'll, we'll pull a little one out, like one from late last year. It might be. 10, 11, 12 inches, something like that. There he is. So yeah, smaller fish, not, not exactly 10 or 11, 12 inches, but yeah. like we were seeing earlier. Learning a lot about where these snakehead like to hang out. Should help us get on some more fish tomorrow. You go through current or depth or whatever, nice little bass, they'll go through it, but they prefer not. And that's why I think they love a place like this. You got grass, you got relatively low current, a lot of gar. Big white cat. Wow, we don't see a lot of white catfish. Nice one. Bullhead, catfish. There's a lot of fish here that I didn't know lived here. It's crazy to see how diverse this fishery is. Tons of different species popping up. Yeah. I always thought of them as being further up north. That's one of the few fish we've seen today that's actually native to this part. Of really? Yeah. It's interesting that the snakehead seem to be the most resilient against the shocking. Usually when you see that, that's a snakehead. Yeah, you got it out in front of me. Watch your left side, Reggie. Several big ones have gotten away. Yeah, I thought he got away.
and most of the fish world, like the bigger fish are always females. Yeah. But in the snakehead world, for whatever reason, it seems like almost all the bigger fish we've ever seen are always males. And they, 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 they we call them big uglies because they, they just get black. They lose their pattern. Like, you know, the snakeheads sometimes have a really they're cool beautiful. pattern. Yeah, when yeah, they're smaller, yeah. Smaller ones. They got iridescent, they have purple and different colors in there. And the, the, the males just get huge. And they get, like, catfish, like this huge, big head. Yeah. And they just, they're just black. Uh, and they, and they, they're ugly. I mean, <laughs> even, even me, if I, I still call them ugly. <laughs> That's got to be a snake. Yeah, way back up in there. Oh, nice. That's a big, ugly man. Big one. That's what I was talking about before. They get, oh, dude. They get a big head and they, they just look black. That's what I was looking for, Austin. <laughs> That's a big, ugly man. Big boy. Some big snake head in here. So that was 1,200 seconds or a third of an hour. Gotcha. I think, I think we got maybe eight or nine. And what we saw was the same trend, which is pretty cool, in terms of the, the, the curve. You know, the increase, uh, plateau, decline. So okay. we saw that in our relative abundance numbers, which is just fish per hour. Sure. And then our absolute abundance numbers, which is a population estimate in the creek. So we actually came up with a number. You know, in 2012, I think it was 600 adults in that creek. And then it was like 510. And then the next year it was 330. Yeah. So you saw this decline. And then, I, you know, once in a while, it, it bumped up last year a little bit, but not, not to where it was before. But, you know, a lot of that's due to strong year classes. Just right. Any fish, whether it's... Sure, yeah, there's going to be fluctuations. Yeah, so you get a good spawn, that's going to push it, push numbers up. But it also makes sense that when a species is first introduced, it's non-native, right. you know, the, the ecosystem doesn't know how to handle it, fish aren't eating them, they don't know what they are, and then, uh, yeah, things kind of... even out. So. Right. These are like the ultimate snake uh, escape artists, dude. They, they can't uh, get up to gulp, and then the weight of their brethren on top of them, will let they, so they basically just drown. Huh. Drowning fish, that's a new one. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> The problem is, like, it's technically not legal for, for you all to do this because you're in possession of a live snakehead. Even All right, so we just got done shocking the snakehead. We were averaging about 30 fish an hour. A lot of times they'll shock up the snakehead, tag them, and release them. But this trip, they're actually harvesting the fish to har harvest some of the organs. They can learn a little bit more about the, uh, the different specimens that we brought. So they're going to be weighing these fish, measuring them, taking out some of the organs, weighing the ovaries, all kinds of stuff. So they can really kind of figure out how old these fish are, what they've been doing since they spawned. So you're saying they were first introduced here in 2004. Well, two, no, 2004, 2004 is when we them. first found them. We've had reports ever since the Crofton Pond in 2002 in Maryland. That's what I heard and of. Then they the had first. the Wheaton Pond in 2003 in Maryland, and both of those were eradicated. And since then, we had a ton of reports. Everybody and their brother were calling up. You know, I caught a snake kid, and then we check it out. And it was a bowfin or an eel or I was know, wondering something. if you guys had bowfin oh, yeah. I did I just did some well, bowfin fishing very similar species yeah, very similar which right? bowfin are native though to the US right it's interesting to me how a fish from China Russia Korea could like evolve so similarly to a fish here and where originally they had no contact that just right it just seems like a kind of a logical place in the food chain for a fish to develop, I guess. They are amazingly similar in yeah. appearance and, and a lot of things. Even even though the bowfin's not an obligate air breather, I think it is a facultative air breather. Wait, what is that? They're obligated? And so, and so the, yeah, so basically the, the bowfin can rely on a, like a primitive lung. I think when, when kind of like gar, I think oxygen right. levels get too low, it can supplement what it gets from the from the water with you know, airborne oxygen, whereas the snakehead is obligate, it has to gulp. If, if you just f keep the snakehead underwater, it will drown, which is really? a bizarre concept. You're and telling me this fish 
can't survive underwater indefinitely. That is Isn't a that new weird? one. Isn't that weird? That and I didn't really one. grasp that for years after I started working with the fish. And that makes sense because, I mean, really to spot these fish while we're fishing for them, we're looking for bubbles, we're looking for a little swirl, they're them coming up. Yeah. And that makes sense now that they have to come up to, yeah. to breathe. The higher in the metabolism, the big boy. more often they come up. 779 and 40, so like in the summer months, 30, they come up more often. Mm -hmm. Even. So what's that he's taking out there? So what he's doing is he's breaking away some of the cartilage and other structure to get at the fluid-filled sacs that hold the otoliths. Otolith. These are the sagittal otoliths that come in pairs, and they're basically little pieces of calcium. Uh, some fish, like on red drum and striped bass, for instance, they get huge. Mm. They're as big as your thumbnail. People make jewelry out of them. Earrings, oh, wow. uh, necklaces, um, otolith jewelry. That's them right there? Yeah, yeah these are them. Well, I'll show you some maybe a little bit bigger. All this stuff here you don't see in normal fish. Um, this is the apparatus that's associated with the air breathing and converting it back to the gill membranes. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna gently sort of palpitate the gut, see if there's anything that was freshly consumed. And 2021. Voila, banded killifish, which are the number one food item by number. Uh, if you're doing frequency of occurrence, this is the, the snakehead's favorite food item. And so what we have here is three partially digested banded killifish. Banded killifish. Yep. So that's the number one prey that's item by one. number. And you said the number one prey item by weight is bluegill Correct. sunfish. Correct. And the, these are native fish. Uh, but there's recently been a study done on one of the creeks where we were also studying snakeheads, and that woman who published her study has now demonstrated that the banded killifish are more abundant in these creeks, or at least in her study creek, than they've ever been. Huh. And that's with snakeheads here for 10 plus years. So despite it being the number one prey item for snakehead, they're actually increasing in numbers. Yes. Nine grams on the banded killifish. And actually the... Snakehead that John and I cleaned uh, had a big sunfish in its belly. Now this has something huge in its gut. Looks like a bluegill. Yeah. Non native, but that is a bluegill. That's the cavity. So that the whole thing's a swim bladder. Whole thing's and you said it's like one of the biggest, kind of it's relative huge. to their size. Yep, it's huge. And, and again, you think that's partially yeah, because perfect. they're storing oxygen in the wintertime, they kind of hibernate, you said, right? Right. They shut down. It's, true, it's a true hibernation, just like a black bear. They, their metabolism goes way down. They bury in the mud. When the water temperature gets below a certain level, it's probably about the mid-40s Fahrenheit. Okay. And they just shut down. And they don't move for weeks, sometimes even months. Yeah, you want the you want and they, they come back out in the kind of groggy in the spring. And, so summertime is the time to fish for these things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, late spring and into summer. Yeah. It could be an immature female or it could be a male. Since we didn't find the, uh, you can't find the testes on these fish. 599 and 1886. So if you find ovaries, it's a female. If you don't find ovaries, it's either immature or it's a male. Can't find the testes. It's the testes, it's a fish that has no balls. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a filament that's the size of a thread. Huh. So some fish have huge gonads, uh, and when you squeeze them, you know, sperm goes everywhere. Some other fish have, same problem. have, uh, have almost no gonads. And like so John. You wonder. <laughs> I'm like you a wonder. eunuch. <laughs> yeah, this so fish is getting eggs, close. Huh? She's probably, yeah. I would say, a week or two out from spawning. For her body size, this is a pretty uh -huh. good mass. This is going to be probably well over 100, maybe pushing 150 grams. Yeah, wow. Of, uh, you can see the individual eggs there. And so I think it's really interesting, you know, like obviously a lot of fish like bass protect their eggs during the spawn, but this is one of the few fish that actually protects their young, right? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. And male, male, a male bass will guard the, the, the fry too, but, but the, the snake, the snakeheads are more adamant about protecting for a longer period of time. And typically a lot of, they'll have both male and female guard. Right. So that kind of helps ensure a higher level of survival. For such a mean fish, like I wouldn't have pegged it as like the loving parental type. <laughs> well, they, they'll cannibalize too. Really? Just, most fish do, and snakeheads aren't an exception to that. So, you know, what we're doing is looking in the guts, and we've seen baby snakeheads in the stomachs. Probably not as much, I used to say almost as often as bass, but I think probably bass outweigh them by just a tiny bit. But neither are really what you call significant food items. Yeah, in right. Terms of making up the Maybe when times are tough. The majority of their diet. But really yeah. easy opportunity. Yeah, to yeah. And, and I think they're total opportunists. And John made, uh, John made a good point that, you know, other fish like bluegill or bass, they've got sharp spines, they've got maybe sharp gill plates, they've got some kind of natural defenses or deterrences for other fish consuming them. But these guys, you would think, as a baby, is just like the easiest prey. I mean, they don't have anything to hurt. And they're kind of like a neon orange. Really? 
eat me, eat me, right? <laughs> everything wants to eat baby snakeheads. If you take the parents away from the nest, um, everything, mosquito fish, little you know, bluegill, white perch, whatever, I mean, they just go ravage the baby snakeheads because they're air breathers too. So right. they're, they're learning to air breathe and they're cycling up to the surface of water. It's like, yeah, it's what could be more meal. appetizing? Yeah. Right? All right, so I mean, I know what, what Jonathan here is, has been telling me for years, what his opinion is on the kind of friend or foe argument. I know there's still plenty of research to be done and, and that's, you know, you're playing a huge role in that, uh, especially here on the Potomac. But so far, based on what you're finding, what is your kind of initial thoughts on whether or not these snakehead are just decimating populations of other fish or they're gonna, drive some other fish to endangerment or whatever. I mean, what do you think the real impact of these fish on the fishery is looking like so far? Well, that's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> I mean, I'll take my best stab at it. First, let me preface what I say by saying that it's illegal to move fish in almost every state. It probably is in every state. I don't know the rules in every state, so I can't speak for every state. Right. But in Virginia and in most of our neighboring states, it is illegal to move any species of fish alive from one water body to another. So we absolutely don't want people moving anything. Um, and it's illegal and it's a class one misdemeanor to move these snakeheads around. It means you get jail time, um, pay a big fine. Uh, so we're serious about that. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I would offer that given what we've learned so far, and, and that's 15 years of research in, in the tidal Potomac system, so far uh, the early claims of, of disaster have not been realized, and it doesn't look like they will be realized. Um, now, Snakehead continues to colonize new area, right. which is, is concerning and could be problematic. Sure. But, but given the fish community here, what their habits have been, what their numbers are doing, um, I would certainly say that we dodged the bullet, you know, uh, it, based on early prognostications. Well, sure. And 15 years, it sounds like a long time, it but really like in the grand time. scheme of, the, of, of right. any Things ecosystem, could it's, it's Things nothing. Things change. Yeah. If you look at the blue cat problem, and a lot of people would say there is a problem, um, you know, that took that took a lot of years to manifest itself. It was a lot longer than 15, but at the same time, then you look at the, the lifespan of a blue catfish and the maximum size of a blue catfish, right. and, and that both of those are much longer or larger than, than a northern snakehead. So right. I think it varies, this whole invasion uh, process and, and how the, an ecosystem responds is not only based on the ecosystem, but also on the individual invader. And so the blue catfish is a whole, you know, it's like comparing apples and oranges. Right. So, but, but in the snakehead scenario, based on what we found out, it, it certainly seems like uh, things are not as dire as initially predicted. Right. Well, I think like one good takeaway from this whole thing is just that if your definition of invasive is a non-native species, I think that there's a kind of widespread belief that if a fish is non-native, it is detrimental. And I think like we were talking about on the boat, that painting it with that broad brush is, is incorrect. With some examples being that technically largemouth bass are non-native here, rainbow trout, trout, you know, a lot of species of hydrilla you mentioned is non-native yet has right. had a positive impact on the on the fishery Absolutely. in your in your opinion. And so I think if nothing else, it's just that, you know, don't jump to the conclusion that it's non-native, it's ruining everything, because that certainly is not the case. Would you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Uh, well said, well stated. And, and, and it's and invasiveness is such a subjective phrase, word, theory, whatever you want to place on it, and it varies from one person to another. And although there are legal definitions, um, and, and the Northern Snakehead has been placed by the federal government and the Aquatic Invasive Species Task Force as an invasive, simply because of the unknown. Right. So a lot of the unknowns what gets a lot of people. Right. They don't know. So there's, there's, there's fearfulness and the unknowing. Of course. And because people don't know where this is going to end up, uh, a lot of people are still really, really concerned about it. And over time, I think we We've, we've learned a lot, and so there's no question that, that some of the early statements were, were not based on, on good content. Right, That's the right. nicest way I can put that. Well, I think it's killer what you guys are doing, and, and uh, I think this fish deserves to have people like you try and actually conduct some research, do some science to really get to the bottom of what their impact is on the fishery, and so... Yeah, um, I, and, and, I, and I'm not a... I'm not a um, 
I'm not I'm not supporting the fish. Sure. And I'm, not the, I'm not saying it's, it's a good fish. I'm not saying it's a bad fish. Right. Uh, all Mike and Reggie and I are doing every day we're out here is we're just trying to f figure out what's really happening. And then I'm trying to tell people the honest truth of what's really happening. If, if it was a disaster, I'd say it's a disaster. Right. If it's not a disaster, I'll say it's probably not a disaster. Yeah. So, I mean, that's to me, that's that's our responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. As stewards of the resource absolutely. is to try to find out what's really happening and, and give you accurate information. If we can't do that, then we may as well go home. Today has been really eye-opening and a really cool experience. I've never seen empty mail this kind of work done, and it's really interesting, kind of learning how you know what this process is like and, and how you guys go about learning about these fish. I'm really glad you made it out, 50. man. It's, it's wonderful to meet Appreciate you. Appreciate you letting me get in the way. <laughs> ah, you are in the way. Oh, Jesus! Nice. Yeah. That is a lot of meat. Waste not, want not. The organs and stuff, all that's being researched. The flays will not be wasted. They will be going to some hungry mouths. John, dude, hey. that was a ton of fun, man. Really eye-opening. Uh, it's cool to see kind of how all this stuff goes down. So if people want to learn more about Snake Ed, right. beyond what we did today, where can they go to find out more? Uh, probably our website is a really good place to start. Uh, okay. Department of Game Inland Fisheries, Virginia government, okay. dgif.virginia.gov. Um, we've got some great videos there. Perfect. Probably not quite as good as your video, but they're gonna be close. Probably better, yeah. Maybe, I don't know. Um, subjective, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Like snakeheads. <laughs> You're just like snakeheads, yeah. right, right. But, uh, yeah, our website would be a good place to start, and there'll be some links from there. Some some work that Mike and I have done is published. You can get the links from that on Excellent. our website as well. Excellent, guys. Well, there's a link to the website down in the description. Get on there if you wanna learn more about these fish. And so, Tomorrow, Jonathan and I are meeting back up with Haley. We're gonna go fishing for these fish again. We're gonna kind of put together what we learned fishing the other day and then what we learned here today from John Odenkirk and his team and kind of try to put all that together and see if we can't catch some more of these fish and hopefully a couple bigger ones. John, thanks go. again, man. Yeah, that's great. So much fun. Yeah, Good great to tomorrow. meet you. Yeah, thanks.